Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, you are so much in the right place at the right time. I bless the Lord today. And I thank my Father for all the spiritual blessings that He bestowed in Christ for all of us as we gather together in this place, a specially prepared place for all of us. Oh, you are so much loved. You are so much brought by the Holy Spirit to listen exactly to this message. You know, I was looking into what the Lord is doing. And uh, of course, all this religious stuff is going on. And all this theological battle, I don't know if you have time to go and look on the internet and see people fighting for all these explanations of grace and too much grace and too little grace and uh, sinners, sons, what's going on there? And I'm telling you what the Lord is showing me. And I want to introduce our today's presentation of that. That He is bringing a conquering through the power of truth of all the realm of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And He is bringing us into the overcoming through the power of the tree of life. We are coming from that place. Remember what it says in Revelation chapter 22? Blessed are the ones that washed their clothes into the blood of the Lamb. And I always thought it's about the clothes that he's talking about. It's not you on the inside because you are already pure on the inside you are like him but the clothes are washed and this is the way you interface you communicate with the outside the clothes are washed this is the change happening in the mind of the body of Christ in the soul of the body of Christ by the blood of Jesus we cleanse the clothes and then he says so he can have authority over the tree of life we are not coming here to tell you about the tree of life we are not preaching to you about the life of God. We come the authority over the tree of life to impart into your life the life of God, the fruit of righteousness, the awareness of oneness with the Lord right into your soul because your soul was washed by the blood of Jesus. And to enter the gates of the city. We'll be talking more about this. I just want to bring this up. And again, you can go to the blog and see these uh, words. Um, we have them right here about relationship. See, that's, that's something that I noticed. People are preaching the message but they are absolutely missing the point. People talk about feeling the presence of God. Everybody talks. The presence comes, the feelings come. But feelings without a true relationship are deceptive. People talk about a place kingdom we come into the place of the kingdom we talk about the place we talk about church we talk about ministry we talk about sunday gatherings a place without a true relationship is death the only place where there is no relationship with the father with god is the place of death we talk about position 
You know, lots of, lots of years people talk about the attributes of God. Oh, I want to relate to God's goodness. I want to relate to God's holiness. God's holiness has been exposed here. How do you relate to places, to attributes? That's no relationship. I cannot talk to my wife's goodness for goodness sake. I cannot. I cannot relate to my wife's humbleness. I talk to my wife. My relationship is with the person that's the living relationship. And everything that comes from there, I receive. I come into this position of relationship, but I relate to the person. You have, you are not given a position in Christ. You are given a name. You are given a person. You are born of Him. You are given a living relationship with a living God. That's what you're given. The tree of knowledge of good and evil has been preaching messages. Messages that look like they have the truth. They sound right. They have lots of good things in those messages. No relationship with a person. A true relationship without love is emptiness, struggle, battle, war. This is the doctrines battle. They always fight with doctrines. It's always because it's a relationship without a person relationship. It's not a true relationship. It's a mind full with a tree of knowledge and awareness of separation that brings people in these disputes and battles. We are coming from above. We are not coming from beneath. We don't come to prove your doctrine right or wrong. You know God is not right and God is not wrong. Did you ever think about that? God is not right and God is not wrong. God is love. Love is not right or wrong. <laughs> love is. God is love. That's where God, that's where you are coming from. We have a living relationship with God in eternal life. Remember John 17? And eternal life is this, to know, to have a relationship with the Father and with the Son. This is eternal life. We think about how the Trinity, how the Father, how the Son, how the Holy Ghost are in this amazing relationship. Where Jesus says, you know, everything I have is of the Father. When the Father says, everything I have is in the Son. When the Son says, Holy Spirit is going to take all and impart to you, and all I have is the Father. So everything He has, it's mine. But I give everything to the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? The amazing relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is what we introduce you to. Because you are born into this relationship. It comes absolutely from the knowing, from the tree of life, with the authority we tell you about this. Lots of our meetings, lots of things you're going to hear for the several Sundays from now are coming from this position from above. You might struggle with some of them. You might go back and wrestle in the tree of knowledge and try to discern and pick the good and fight the bad until the time when the Father is going to come and quicken. Everything we say to you is going to just quicken it in your heart. 
and you'll know it and you're gonna enter rest <laughs> you're gonna say I got it <laughs> I got it I almost had it I just I thought I have to figure it out first I invite you love you so much you are absolutely in the right place I'm so glad we don't have to battle on doctrines and I don't have to really tell you which teaching we have and you have and you don't have and and I'm telling you coming from this unity with you in the love of my father I'm inviting you in this relationship and listening to this truth and these messages I love you just join us we're going into worship right now and uh, just just stay with us all of us let's just get together in the worship to the Father Amen
worship is the time when He comes. He becomes one. He takes over. Oh, yes, His life takes over. We worship You, Father. Let's worship Him. Let's worship Him. Worship you, Father. Worship you, Father. We worship you, Lord. a season the Lord says what worship is gonna come into a new chapter for your life in a place of relationship that you haven't been before you had the seeds of worship inside you as the Sun planted those seeds but now says the Lord those seeds are growing in your soul the seeds of worshiping are growing in the soul of the body of Christ. Worship is coming to a new season, to a new chapter. It's opening up as the Lord sees worship, as the Father desires such worshipers in spirit. that no one could number they were singing to the father they were worshiping they were all dressed in white clothes because they washed their clothes in the lamb's blood a multitude that was worshiping the Lord oh join us join us as we worship him
Listen to this song, Haratosha Paralas. Listen to this song. The Lord is saying, I will wipe all tears from their eyes. All the pain and suffering. I'm reaching, I'm reaching I love you, my son I love you, my son All the time, all the time I love you, my son Oh, he's wiping all Deep inside that pain, deep inside the soul, that isolation, those fears, those separations, kept bound down, kept in the bondage. Oh, you are mine, says the Lord. You belong to me, says the Lord. 
I break those chains. Oh, there's no ropes, there's no ties that can keep you separated from me, says the Lord. I am coming. I am breaking through right from inside of you, right through your mind, right through your feelings, right through your past, right through your present, right through time and space. God is breaking through. He is the lover of your soul. He loves you. He loves you. In every detail of your life, He loves you. He loves you. He wipes the tears. He wipes those tears. And He's telling you, here is joy coming to your life. You haven't experienced joy for a long season. But I am turning your mourning into joy, says the Lord. I am changing the sadness into victory, into an oil of gladness that I'm pouring upon you, that I'm bringing out of your soul, inside, every particular detail of your life I am pouring the oil of gladness upon you today is a day of joy joy my joy says the Lord no I'm not talking about the joy of the world I'm giving you my joy because my joy, says the Lord, is your strength. You can find strength in my joy. I'm singing over you. Oh, new songs. You never heard those songs before. They're songs of joy. I'm rejoicing over you, my son. I'm rejoicing in the middle of the night, through the day, as you're going to your business, to your work, to do the normal things, you'll hear the whisper. Joy is going to burst through. My joy, says the Lord. My joy. Oh, yes. What do you think that river is? The river of life that flows. It's so full of joy. It's my joy abounding, coming right out of my heart. It's my love and my joy flowing out of me. That's the river of life. The kingdom of my kingdom. My kingdom is righteousness. It's peace and it's joy in my spirit. Joy. Ah, oh, it's flowing so powerfully. <laughs> yes. You know, you haven't experienced this for a long time. I see that. I see how you try to bring memories, but I'm telling you, don't mind those memories because the joy I give you is going to overshadow any memories of you maybe being a kid or rejoicing or the joy of salvation. This is going to overshadow everything. The joy of my presence. The joy of knowing my love. That's what I want you to experience. I love you. And I'm rejoicing over you. I praise you, Father. I praise you, Father. I praise you, Father. I praise you, Father. Resurrection. Oh yes. 
nothing can separate you from my love. Nothing can separate you. Rejoice. Rejoice. And again I say,
Uh, hello. And hello. <laughs> nice to see some of you guys. And you guys. Um, you know, it's really, it's really amazing, Val, what you were talking about uh, before we started the worship, about the tree of knowledge of good and evil and its definitions and religious definitions and coming from a religious background, you know, we were taught so many things. Uh, what is grace? What is love? What is faith? Uh, what is repentance? And so in my carnal mind, which is totally based off the knowledge of good and evil, there's already definitions ingrained, already framed, and they're so wrong. <laughs> they are so wrong. And they can really, really cause a lot of damage, especially when uh, you become aware of being a son, and all of a sudden you pop from down here and you're up there, and you're trying to apply all these definitions and all these things that you've learned or were taught, and nothing seems to make sense. And so I encourage you to let go. <laughs> just, just let it go. You know, don't worry about it. Just let it go and ask him to redefine everything for you. And uh, I definitely encourage everyone to um, do word studies when, when the Holy Spirit leads you to just really get into something. Like uh, if you're doing a study on faith, you really want to get the, the fullness and the life out of faith. And you're going through and you're searching scriptures and um, really, really get in there. Really take it and go into the Greek because the, especially the English language is very limited. If you look in the Bible, you see the word love. Well, if you take the word love and you take it into the Greek, you understand that there's different kinds of love. And those aren't expressed necessarily. And so once you go in and you take the concordance and you look at the word and you see the definition, it's something completely different than what you might have thought. For example, the word life. There's three different kinds of life. There's biological life, there's spiritual life, and there's soul life. And you can't really tell that from just plainly reading. I mean, you really got to go in there and the Holy Spirit's totally going to lead you in fresh revelation, amazing uh, life is just going to start pouring out. And so um, one thing I want to talk about is the word repentance, which really, like, when God really opened me up to it, I mean, completely just changed my entire way of, of uh, operating. And it really dealt with a lot of guilt, consciousness, sin consciousness, a lot of condemnation, and <clears throat> it really set me free once I actually knew what I was. And uh, it, was <laughs> it was so funny because coming from, from a Romanian background with a Romanian soul, the word repentance is used a lot. Like in Romanian, the word pocainza, it's, it actually kind of, the way they use it, it even translates to kind of like being a Christian, sort of. It, like, it kind of wraps everything up into one word. It's just it's really bad. And so what I was taught about repentance is, okay, you go out and you sin. You do something wrong. You have to repent, which means you, you stop, you ask for forgiveness, and then you never do it again. So you go and you make the promise, okay, God, I'm never gonna, uh, I'm never gonna do this again. It's over with. You've forgiven me. We move on. And then a week later, you do it again. Now all of a sudden, the promise that you made is now broken. You feel extremely guilty, super condemned, and it just drives you into the ground. It's not weird. So how do you get negative things, or you get all this uh, death, this negative fruit, from something that's of God? How do you get 
death from something that's supposed to create life. Does that, does that make sense? That definition's wrong. <laughs> so what he was showing me about repentance is it has nothing really to do with the thing you did, like the specific sin, as more of having to do with your position. So I was like, okay, position, position, position. I know that God is life, and anything outside of life is death. I know that sin is death. Everything that's separated from God is death. A man comes to Jesus, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me go bury my dad. Let the dead bury the dead. So anything outside of Christ, anything outside of what is born again and is of him, is completely dead. So I was thinking, just thinking, and he just, you know, I love how he takes me through the little baby steps, you know. He just teaches me like a little child, you know. He doesn't give me some crazy, uh, complex instructions. It's just so simple, so simple, so simple. So if you have life, and you have death, and when you sin, you go into, into death, the act of repentance is coming back into life. You see, though a righteous man falls seven times, he always gets back up. See, the act of repentance is in the returning from a fallen state into a risen state, or the upright position. It has nothing to do with the sin, because we know that sin dwells in these members. And until we get our new bodies, you can never escape it. The only way to escape sin is to walk in the Spirit, which is to be in life, to be in Him. So what happens when you sin? You fall into death, and the repentance comes in coming back into life. Super simple, super easy, and it just totally delivers you from any guilt or condemnation, from any shame, and you don't remain there. You know, because that's what condemnation does, is it kind of imprisons you in death, in separation. Oh, I sinned again. God's over there. I'm over here. He's not even looking at me anymore. He's disappointed. He's mad. Now I have to, you know, kind of sit here and be punished for a little bit and then try to work my way back into his good graces, which is just... It is so wrong. Sometimes we... We try to define God by our own ideas, by our own experiences, by what we've learned from the knowledge of good and evil, from how we were raised. Well, I know when my child messes up, I have to punish him, and he's got to learn his lesson, and then he's got to come back and earn my trust, and earn this, and earn that. And we kind of shove God in that group. Oh, well, I messed up. Well, this is my... This is my time of being punished, and then I'll go to church, and I'll worship, and I'll pray, and I'll ask for forgiveness, and then he'll start loving me again. What a load of garbage. When does God ever stop loving you? Never. The only thing that happens is this gets in the way, and it starts dictating and telling you a bunch of lies. The devil comes and starts accusing you, to get you deeper and deeper in that separation. To get you farther and farther away from Him. And this is where the repentance comes in. You got to stop. Ask for forgiveness. So that He can expose everything. Get rid of everything. The blood comes and cleanses you so that you can come back into life. Where you belong. <laughs> And eventually, you'll start getting more and more mature, and it'll be easier and easier. And after a point, you begin to realize that you never really left in the first place. <laughs> but that's for another time. Uh, Val? Hello. Okay. <clears throat> We've been reconciled to him through the blood of his cross. That's what it is. And if 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins. Sin is separation from him. That's what it is. And every time you live in that separation from him, probably every time we think in the tree of knowledge, you know, taught by religion, we should confess that first. Everything that's separating us from the perfect love of the Father, that's sin. I think we, that's probably what we should repent. We should repent of the false repentance. Okay, that's a, that's, how do you say for another time? Yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> I, I explained as we started here that um, I know this season the Lord is coming to, um, through the power of his truth, to destroy all this tree of knowledge type of teachings, doctrines, understanding. Um, probably one of the things that hurts my heart, and I know that's God's heart, is we traveled around the world. And what we've seen is the people that, you know, they have the doctrines, they have their own denominations and churches, they increase with that. Of course, he needs money for that. But lots of the people that actually seek the Lord, I call them their sons. They really belong to the Lord. They are on the outside. They will never step into a church building to stay through a church service. It's like they don't belong. They don't find their place there. And this is around the globe. You know, and probably some of you can uh, testify to that. And, you know, I go in and, you know, after the service is done, so we meet, go to the street and we meet a couple of the people and totally belong to the Lord. I see their hearts. I see their desire of, after God. It's like, so why, I, I cannot even ask them, how come you didn't come to the service? Um, it's like, no, those people have their own agenda. They have to do this stuff in this way. And this is it. So what is the new wine skin for the sons? So this is, this is how we try to connect, we try to gather people that are really seeking the Lord. And one thing that's happening is coming to destroy all this type of an teaching that kept us under the tree of knowledge, that keeps us in a separation mentality. Now, one thing that I saw, and I'm looking out, you know, I'm reading on the internet and I'm seeing what's out there, is that the enemy is only, it always try to simulate. So, okay, if I cannot get you, Adam and Eve, if I cannot get you back in the garden, I'm going to do a virtual garden, and I'm going to simulate something in your mind, in your soul, that's going to make you feel like you never left the garden. You're actually perfect in the garden. I'm going to make this virtual reality around your mind, and I'm going to teach you that everything is okay, and there's no problem. Okay? How is the simulation happening in the tree of knowledge? Because Adam and Eve are already outside. And I've seen this happening through the hundreds of years. Okay? All this type of, let's say, teachings that come that basically do, do nothing but simulating the spiritual truth and reality into the soul of man coming from the tree of knowledge. And you know how I know that's true? Because it's always, always what's good and what's bad about that teaching. What do I like about it? What don't I like? Well, how, uh, do I agree with that? No. Is this from the Bible? No. It's, it's always a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with all these type of teachings, okay, which was never happening when Jesus was talking. <laughs> he, he didn't have any debates. When he says, okay, here's the coin, okay, give Caesar what Caesar, give God what God, 
Nobody said, okay, let me look in the Moses scripture, see if that's according to the scripture. And I want to come and ask him, hey, should we divorce? And he, he says, you know, that's hardness of heart. But from the beginning, it was not like that. Nobody came and said, what, 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 what do you mean? But hold on, Moses says that. And nobody debated his words because they were truth. So I know some of the simulation, that's how I call them, probably because I like virtual uh, reality, but some of this simulation stuff, it's coming in, but it's in the soul, and it's absolutely working on the same tree of knowledge. It is not tree of life. Okay? And you can tell that. It's not producing any life. It's not producing any joy. It's not producing any true relationship with your father. It's just an idea. Might be a nice idea. Might be a good idea. Might be something that, you know, makes sense and maybe, you know, makes you not to go at 9 o'clock in the morning at church, but it's just an idea. Okay? Very important. What, what we want to bring now, and I'm going to go through things that we talked about, okay, um, and maybe, I don't know, a year ago or so. And I want to start reading these verses. And uh, you know we use uh, WIST, which is a scholar translated directly from Greek. It's a little bit harder. So if you want to study, it's good. If you want to use it for your devotional, you have to have time. Okay? If you are just the one that does the manna in the morning on your way out, you get your little coffee and run, and you want just a little scripture, you might not want to read Wist, okay? Because <laughs> that might stop you, well, might make you late, okay? <laughs> late for work. Because <laughs> it gets you really to think and go deeper with that, okay? So that's, that's all I want to say about that translation. I definitely recommend it. So just a just couple of samples here. Ephesians 1, from 5 to 8. And you guys, uh, some of you have it here. And again, you guys will have it. Um, you can read it with me if you have a Bible. Ephesians 1 from 5 to 8. It says, Having previously marked us out to be placed as adult sons through the intermediate agency of Jesus Christ for himself, According to what seemed good in his heart's desire, I love that, resulting in praise of the glory of his grace, and now he's talking about his grace, which he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. Question. What time he bestowed this grace upon us? That's when he made the plan. That's when he placed us as adult sons. Everything about grace was bestowed, was poured upon, was provisioned for us in him before we even started the salvation. Thing. Before you go, went to church, raised your hand, you got your water baptism, and before that, grace was provision for you in Christ. Okay, let's keep reading. In whom, in the beloved, talks about Jesus, we are having our redemption through his blood, the putting away of our trespasses, according to the wealth of his grace. So he deals with your trespasses. He forgives your sins, not according to how bad the sin is, but according to the wealth of his grace. How big is the wealth of his grace? Well, he provisioned that in Christ for us before the whole thing started. Right? In Christ, right there, where he placed us. He provisioned grace. Is it going to be too much for him to forgive you? Never. It's already provision to forgive 
anything that you might be doing. So all the trespasses were covered, were putting away according to the wealth of his grace, which he caused, which being the grace, right? He caused to superabound to us in the sphere of every wisdom and understanding. Now we're coming into the soul. Now we are coming into where you live right now. He caused that something that he provisioned for you in Christ to superabound and bless you now through wisdom and knowledge that's coming in your life, in your soul. Okay? So it starts in him, beyond time, and comes in time, grace being somehow the measure of how much he works in us, in our souls, according to this wealth of, for the praise of the glory of grace. John 1.14. I love this translation of Wist. And the word entering a new mode of existence became flesh. I love that. New mode of existence. That's pretty cool. And lived in a tent, his physical body among us. <laughs> Can you see him carrying the tent after him? And it's like, okay, I'm going to Capernaum now. <laughs> I'm going to the tent. Um, inside the tent was the word. <laughs> Yeah, Corturari. <clears throat> yeah. And we, we gazed with attentive and careful regard and spiritual perception at his glory, a glory such as of a uniquely begotten son from the Father, and catch this, full of grace and truth. Grace was provisioned in him for us, but when he entered this new mode of existence, everything that was provisioned before the time for us in Christ was manifested on this earth. So the new mode of existence basically came to reveal grace. Reveal grace that was right there before, but we had no idea until he came full of this grace to manifest it. Okay? Um, I call this um, grace manifested. I started saying that um, Talking about principles, Christian principles, even deep Christian principles, without understanding true relationship with the person, it's just a waste. It's death. Doesn't get us anywhere. People have extreme, intelligent, super nice teachings without giving you the person's relationship, a true relationship. It's empty. You know why people debate grace? You know the why people fight upon is this grace, too much grace, too little grace? You know why? Because the word that they got, the teaching that they got, does not bring them relationship with grace as a person. That's why. Tree of knowledge in good and evil is a shadow of things and deals with what's good about grace, what's bad, what's good, what's too much, what's too little. Is this grace? Is this not? You know, and you're going to fight the doctrine of grace forever. Relationship. Did you ever think to have a relationship with the spirit of grace? Because grace had relationship, was created, was placed in Christ for us as a provision of life. 
before we even started the plan of salvation, in him was there and was manifested through him. It's amazing how important grace is. And it's not an attribute of God. I'm not relating to God's graciousness. What is? Who is grace? And I want to bring you into this. And I'm telling you, going through these words, going through these verses, I challenge you. It's going to free you up of any debate about grace teachings. Okay? No more debates and fights about grace teachings if you have a true relationship with grace. Okay? Here it is. Grace is a ruler of the kingdom. I'm going to try to go fairly quick through this. Romans 5.21, so as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns. Grace is not a state of mind. Grace is not a position. Grace rules. That's very important. Okay? Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That's very interesting. Law was given to an intermediate of an angel. Do you know that? It says that in the book of Acts. Through an intermediate of an angel. Law has spiritual power and the law has a glory. 2 Corinthians 3 talks about the glory that's passing away. It says if something that's passing away has such a glory, how much more glory is going to have the new covenant? The law has glory. And they would see that on the face of Moses. And he had to veil himself because they could not look at that. So the law had the dominion. And he says, you are not under the dominion of the law. See, these are not, if you think the tree of life, these are not positions, these are not mental assumptions, these are not options, logical places that your mind thinks, okay, I'm under grace, that means I can do this or that. This is not a m mental place. This is a relationship. You have a relationship with the law. You are under the dominion of the law. And screams in you all this lust and things of do not do that. Do that. Don't do that. Why did you look like that? Why did you think of that? All those things under the dominion of law. It's a power that works in you. It's not just a mental state. So grace works. The power has a dominion and you are under the dominion of grace. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Law has strength. Law has power and has a dominion. Okay. What is a dominion? It's a place of lordship established by a covenant. By the new covenant, by being born of the Lord, by the blood of Jesus, you enter into a new covenant and you were moved from the dominion of law into the dominion of grace. Grace rules. Grace has a dominion. It's not just a state of mind. It's not a permission or not permission of things. Grace is a person that you have a relationship. It's a creation of God. The a spiritual uh, creation that you have a relationship with in your soul. We'll understand more about this. Romans 7, 1, 4 do you not know, brethren, 
um, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Okay? So what it talks here is, is again, Romans 7, 1 through 4. It says that we... Um, we are bound to the law because we are born in the flesh. Because we are born in the flesh, we are like married to the law. Okay? The law is the husband. We are the wife. The law does not die. It says here, if the husband would die, then the, the wife would be free to marry. The law doesn't go away. Right? So what's the plan? So it says here in verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, to the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him. So what happened? Since the law doesn't die... The wife dies. Since the husband doesn't die, the wife dies. Wow, God is so smart. <laughs> I love that. So he sends Jesus. He says, when you die, if you believe, you died with him. So the law is very well, very strong, in power, doing its own thing. But guess what? I died to the law. By the new birth, I'm born under a different dominion. I'm born under grace. Does it make sense? Does it make sense to you? Okay? I die towards that. The law is not changed. People, you see, again, tree of knowledge, good and evil. Well, how much of the Old Testament we should follow? Uh, should we follow the Ten Commandments? Should we follow this? Should we follow that? Um, what about those uh, commandments? What about this? What about that? This is, uh, this is irrelevant, really. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's, there are two dominions. You are either under this, and you better keep them all. Paul says that one time, if you, to Galatians, if you really want to be righteous through this, you better keep them all and keep them perfect. Because law is a harsh master. I'm telling you, it's going to beat you up in the shape. Absolutely, you know. But if you died already to that, how much is a dead man responsible to his boss? My boss is not going to ask me to be at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday morning at work if I'm dead. I mean, you can ask. but <laughs> So if I'm, if I'm dead, I'm done with that and I'm born into this. Okay? So these are very important. These are dominions. Okay? And this, the word is very clear. Um, next one, Romans 5.17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gifts of righteousness, r grace rules through the righteousness, there are people that are under dominion of grace, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. This is the place of overcoming. The word life there is the zoe life, is the spiritual life. And this is something that comes from above and rules over the circumstances in any other level. Because you are under grace, you've been given ruling over every other existence of this world. This is what opens the eyes up. Okay? In Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. We said that grace is a ruler, right? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We'll go and, and talk a little bit more about this. We are born of him... 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that 
Whoever joins the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. We're talking about the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Lord Jesus. Spiritually, we are in that place, oneness with Him. Our soul somehow needs to change, needs to learn. Our souls come from under the tree of knowledge. The way the definitions, the way we learn, the way religion taught us, and the way our souls are equipped are through grace. So somehow grace is in between who we are in the spirit and our souls. This is where grace rules over the souls. This is where grace is teaching us and is working on us to train our souls. The souls of the sons are trained by grace. Let's, let's look at this. <laughs> I, I like this. I called it going undercover. If I can click. Going, going undercover, covered by grace. Walking in full awareness of his name needs to be covered by grace. Again, we're talking souls. Okay? We're not covered by grace in the spirit. You know, <laughs> we're one right there. We're one with the Lord. But our souls need to be covered by grace. And um, to allow people in the world to relate to us. So there's two ways. One is we interface, we work from the spirit realm to our souls through grace. At the same time, people relate to us through grace. Okay? Um, very interesting place in Ezekiel 44, 19. It talks about the priests. The priests were supposed to have two types of garments. There was a garment that they used when they would go and minister to the Lord. And they would go out to the people. They had to change their clothes. <laughs> you cannot wear the Sunday clothes at work. No, that's not it. Uh, um, but there were like different type of clothing. And it said here is in their holy garments, they could not go out. So they shall not sanctify the people. We talked about this a lot in our meetings here, that if people would be allowed to see who we really are in the spirit, they would be completely freaked out and run away. Okay? So lots of the things that you see, the way you listen to this message, you look at this camera and you guys listen to, lots of times is covered by grace. That's what you hear. You hear, um, you know, the, the melody of the voice, you know, you see the eyes, the hands moving, the laugh coming through. Your interaction is actually how grace is manifesting the words of God that are coming from the Spirit to you. You hear grace right now, okay? Um, Jesus was doing that. Look at that. God in flesh was manifested through grace. Luke 2.40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. What, what do you think? It was just like God was just looking at him as, oh, my boy, my boy, you're such a nice boy. What, what do you mean the grace of God was upon him? That's exactly it. Grace was covering him. People could not really relate to who he was because probably the earth would have just been completely disappearing. Okay? And he could not relate to them, to who he was as the word of God. But grace was covering that. Hebrews 2.9. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. I love that. Jesus walked covered by grace to seek and find the lost. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's something amazing that the grace is doing. Some, some work of grace, and we'll get more into it. 
At special occasions, the Father revealed the glory of the Son, Matthew 7, 2. And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. This is way above where grace was. Okay? This was God himself manifesting, coming right through that soul and through that body, and shining. It was God himself shining through. What is grace doing for the souls of the sons? Ephesians 3, 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Again, dominion of grace. Working with the souls of the sons. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. This is going back to the place in Ephesians 1. Listen to this. According to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's exactly what we read in Ephesians 1. The provision of grace that was done for us in Christ Jesus. Here it is. It says, all this grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the time. You know why I like when this is according to that? Because time and space may be very fluctuating, very changing. You know, you might go through different chapters in your life. You might not even like the chapter that you are in. You might read kind of like, you skip pages, you know, like you do, like you don't like the book. You kind of skip pages, like, oh, I don't like what I am. I, can I get to the next chapter? You know, so uh, it's changing. You know, you say, well, I need more grace now. Oh, last chapter, I needed less grace. And you cannot really measure that. So I love when he says that everything is given to us, is poured upon us according to the grace that was already provisioned for us in Christ Jesus. There's nothing that's bigger than the provision of God. Very interesting, the power of grace. You know, Grace has to be something visible, something that has a will, a power, a manifestation. It's not just like uh, a state in, uh, you know, everybody loves each other and we're all, all under grace. Look at this. Look at these verses. Listen to them. Acts 4.33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. How could you tell? Because you've seen the miracles. You've seen some manifestations that were completely amazing, supernatural. And people will say, wow, this is the grace of God manifesting the sons. Acts 11.23, when he came and he had seen the grace of God. What do you mean? What did he see? He saw some people very humble on their knees praying to God. What did he see? They see the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. Um, Acts 14.26 for from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. It's like, wow, this is, this is something very powerful. This is not just something that you can afford not to have a relationship with, right? You have to have, you have to seek and understand this relationship with grace. It's, it's amazing. It covers your soul. It provisions everything that you need. Have this. Start this understanding and relationship with grace. 1 Corinthians 15.10 But the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I but the grace of God 
which was with me. Amazing. The grace was doing the work. And Paul's soul learned how to let grace minister to him, minister through him, and bring him into that rest place. Okay? Ephesians 3, 7, which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Amen? Very important, if you look at this, if you look at everything that the, I'm saying today, the debate in the tree of knowledge is because the life of grace is not there. It's a doctrine, it's a teaching, it's an explanation, it's a feeling, it's uh, everything else that your mind in the shadowing place can comprehend. And people debate, they read the Bible, with the definitions of their tree of knowledge they have in their soul. I want you to stop that. I don't want you to debate that way. I want you to move on and say, Lord, what is this grace that you provision for me in Christ before the time began? It, Everything I'm trying to explain about grace has to do with time. I, would, I did something wrong. I went there. I need grace. I need that. I need all these needs are time bound. The gracey provision for you was before time even began to take tick. Grace is something. It's someone that the Lord put to have a dominion. Over the soul of man. Over the souls of the son. Sons come to being born again under the dominion of grace. And have relationship with grace. I can try to think how to escape the law. I can virtually cast me out of that part of law. And come into this super independence of I don't care about the law. I'm free unless you come under the dominion and relationship with grace. You're just in a virtual independence. You don't really know your Lord. The Lord put this structure, if you want, this kingdom structure to serve the souls of the sons. That's why he did it. So he can help you grow. He can help you understand who you are in the spirit. Oh, that's amazing. Look at Jesus. Look at him on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's how you look like. You're in him right there. But your soul that acts in time and space is depending on this grace. Every day is depending on this grace. Grace is working in your soul every day. Love grace. Absolutely love grace. Get out of the tree of knowledge and just start today the relationship with grace. Let's, let's pray together for a minute. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you that you didn't leave any detail out of your plan, your perfect plan that you created, you made for us. Your plan, the counsel of your will that you made in yourself was perfect. And I thank you, Lord, that you prepared and you created grace. You placed the abundance of grace in the Son, the first begotten in Jesus Christ. And in him, you blessed all of us. I thank you today, Father, 
that you open our eyes up to see the provision that we have in you. And every provision comes through a wonderful relationship. I love you, Grace. I love you for what you do in my soul. I love you for all this strength that you bring in my soul. I love you for the way you help me grow. You help me let go and point towards Christ. Every time you point towards Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I thank you so much, Grace. And I thank you that you are imparting this into the people of God, into the souls of the sons as they are listening to this. You are imparting all this power of the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. You impart into them so they can depend on grace. So they can depend on you for their daily lives. Dealing with sin, dealing with addictions, dealing with problems, dealing with sicknesses, dealing with themselves. Thank you that you have enough provisions that you reveal to us every day. Thank you, Father. Everything you did, it's perfect. And we worship you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. As we're going along, we're imparting unto you from the Lord some amazing revelations, truths, realities that you might come into them. For our inheritance is from Jesus. Joint heirs, co-laborers, inheritance of the kingdom of God, inheritors of God himself. This is the fullness that we're called to. As we begin to understand more of this living kingdom, and last week as Val was sharing how uh, we're under tutors and governors to train us and teach us until the time comes that that the sons can come into inheritance. For many of you, that inheritance has begun. When I first realized that grace was a, an amazing spirit, uh, I couldn't even comprehend the abilities that it had. And with grace, faith works. And all these seven spirits before the throne and, and all these angels and all these other kinds of spirits. And they're all servants that operate in, and live by the life of Christ and the love of the Father. But I saw these things from the position of being in Christ. For you and I are one in him, the life-giving spirit. We give life. Now, my soul is under grace, and grace is tutoring my soul, but the day will come when my soul and my spirit will be so absolutely one as the express image of Jesus that I will no longer be under grace, but I will be seated fully with the Lord on his throne. This is where we're going to. We keep our eyes fixed on the goal, on the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Call upon grace this week. Speak to grace this week. Love grace this week. And as you have an unction of the Holy Spirit, release life unto grace this week. Get out that word study and look, go through every scripture on grace and you will be amazed. You'll see where it is the ruler 
over all the kingdom of God, that the Lord himself rules through grace. And at the same time, grace works in the simplest ways to serve the kingdom of God. Thank you for being with us today in Celebration City. It's been a joy. It's been a delight. Uh, you know, we go back over and, and, uh, and, and look at this uh, recording that's online because the, the richness of the living word is so rich and it's so broad-based and it's the height of it and the depth of it is just so amazing. And every bit of it talks about our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and our identification in them. So thank you for being here with us today. Now for you and those of you that are here, I give you an opportunity to sow seed. Everybody on the planet needs money, and this ministry will always need money. It's useful to us, and it is good, a place of great place to sow good seed into good ground. And I give you that opportunity in the name of Jesus. Just push the button on that donation button there on the, on the screen. And those of you here, you can prepare your checks, cash, every bit of this, this life going out into the world. We've spent 30 years traveling. I've spent 42 years traveling around the world, bringing the revelation of our identity. Val and I together for over 25 years together. Continuing on. And now we see right where you are, right where we were in Africa, where we're going in Southeast Asia and over in China and over in India. It's like from within the very end time generation. The very end time generation. And there are ministers all over the world now. And they're ministering a part here. And they're ministering a part there. And they're watering some seed there. And they're watering some seed there. But this I tell you truly. Even as you know, as you listen, as you pay attention to what and how we say, is that the anointing on this ministry is to bring you increase of that life. Not just a seed and not just some water for it. The increase of it. This is a good place to sow your seed. Father, I thank you for every dime, every rupee, every uh, mark, every single type of finance that comes in to continue to send us forth around the world. I thank you for it, Father, that you return it back a hundredfold in this year. All of the seed that's been sown till now. I thank you that you are increasing it. And multiplying it back to the givers. And I help Father that, that they would give with a purpose. For the things that they find useful to them. They sow that seed. Naming that seed and sowing it out. So until next week we bless you. Uh, you know, if you haven't been with us all this time since we've been on the air, go back into some of these archives and, and feed on some of this amazing word that's there. Every bit of it is building. And each week we can experience uh, an increase from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Ever being changed into the image of the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you next week.